for their healthiness, and I also pray for the sick, and I pray that they remember that they are not alone. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what Mark has to say today. In your name I pray. Amen. This Sunday, we're honoring our graduates from high school, college, and the military, and I know that this is, I guess, kind of a little late for us, but it's also a little late since we had the Mount Carmel graduation last week, that it's a little, it's a lot, and for me to even say that's kind of like an understatement, right, for today's time, and, and everybody gets it. But here's the thing that I just want to say, and, and as we enter into communion, that I would like us to think about, is... Parkview Christian Church, one of the things I love so much about Parkview Christian Church is that we don't see young people as the future of the church. We actually see them as the church here and now, that they are, they are as important to us for the future as they are for now. And, and I love that because without young people, Parkview Christian Church could not function. And I'm so happy that I'm part of a church that sees young people that way. That, sure, you're going to be the future of the church, graduates. But you're also part of the present church right now. And for communion, what I want us to do is to be in communion with them, recognizing that they are the light for the future, but we're also the light for right now as well, because we need to shed that light that Jesus gave us on the darkest day, but also the brightest day for us when Jesus went to the cross. It says uh, in Luke eleven thirty three, 33, it says, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it will be hidden. You know, our young people, we don't want to hide you. Or under a bowl, instead, they put it on the stand so that those who come in may see the light. Let's shed God's light, and let's encourage others to do that, and let's remember that for communion. Now, for the communion right now, after I pray, we have the communion trays on either side, and there's a little cup with the bread on top. You have to kind of, well, it's kind of hard one-handed, but I actually can do it kind of, sort of. So, uh, But you peel the top, peel the bottom, you can get that. But after I pray, during a war of my prayer, if you want to go get that right now, we all understand because it will not be served to you. So here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being our light. And thank you also that we can be the light bringers to this world. So I ask that during this time of communion that we pray for graduates, that we that we do our best to encourage them along, but also we recognize that we need to do that as well. So help encourage us to show dear light to this world. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. In just a bit, we're going to show a video to honor those graduates so you can see some of the graduates here from Parkview Christian Church. And 
I want us to specifically to pray for those graduates for their future. And uh, just the, and also to thank for what they've given to Parkview Christian Church. We've got a little gift basket back there for the graduates. As you walk out in the hallway, you can grab that if um, your kind of name is on there. But if you would, if you would pray for those graduates with me right now, I'm going to give you a little bit of time of quiet prayer, and then I'm going to close this up. God, I thank you uh, for putting young people in our church. And right now I want to ask that you be with their future. Um, as, and also some, just the, the uncertainty that that future may hold, especially in this time. And I thank you for them. I thank you for the, the gifts that they bring to Parkview Christian Church. But if they're to leave, uh, I want to ask that you help them shine that light bright to the, to the college campuses, to the new jobs, or wherever they may be going next. That's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, it's pretty exciting to see kids uh, grow up, graduate, and be shot like arrows out into the world to try to do some good for Jesus, and that's exciting for me. This has been a weird year for graduates and for, for all of us, I guess. Back in March, we got the shelter-in-place order. I think it happened on March 13th, uh, is my memory, because it's still kind of seared in there. And, and I've thought, well, we're probably going to be locked down probably until about the 1st of May. Some of the wiser guys at church said, no, it would be the 1st of June. Well, it's been longer than that, and uh, it's really, it's been weird. But let me just say this, and I don't know when it's ever going to be normal or normaler, closer to normal. But the church has never locked down. Even though we met at, the whole group can't be together at one time and all that, that, we're never locked down because we are the church. And like those kids going out with the gospel and the Holy Spirit inside their lives make a difference, so we do where we are as well. But lockdown is frustrating. Anybody? Anybody frustrated? It's, it's frustrating for me. We're trying to get used to the camera thing. Welcome at home. Glad you're watching. Uh, but it's, it's just, lockdown is frustrating. It reminds me of, and Scott will remember this, we had a coach at Wabash Valley that we'd go on the road with basketball players he, did, he wanted them to stay in their rooms the entire night and not leave the room, which that sounds reasonable, correct? So he had this ingenious system where he put a piece of scotch tape on their door. 
And if, you were, if the tape was broken on your door, you didn't play the next night on the road, which was great, except that they only had one, every night one room would be, have the tape broken, a different room every night. You know what happened? They just took turns getting each other out and putting the tape back on. Okay, and that's, you know, they're college, they're, they're smart enough to do those things. But it, it's frustrating and when you can't do what you want to do, go where you want to go, and it is hard. And I hope by now we'd be back to normal, and I don't know when that will be. Uh, but I know this, maybe we needed COVID-19. You'd have to assume so, wouldn't you, if you believe in God, you believe that God's in charge of everything in the world, that there, there must be some good behind this, and I don't think there's, there a lot of things are bad about it, but the good thing is we had to slow down. And when you slow down, you have to think, and it's good to think about what you think about when you slow down. When you have trouble, you need to think about God. If you magnify the Lord, it will make your trouble seem a little smaller. Listen to Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. We will not fear when earthquakes come. Here's trouble. Mountains crumble to the sea. Oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble and the water surge. And the answer comes in verse 10. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation, be honored throughout the world. Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. So when trouble comes, be still, know that he's God. Think about what you think about. I'm starting a series of sermons. It's just four sermons long through the month of August called Lockdown. And what we're going to do, you see, I'm not the first preacher to have the frustration of isolation. And that's common. In fact, we look at the Apostle Paul, who for several seasons of his life was in lockdown, or more like lock up for him. He was actually in prison, shut away from people, couldn't go where he wanted to go, couldn't go preach, couldn't do the things he wanted to do, couldn't go visit people in the hospital. All the, all the stuff we deal with, he was dealing with then. And what he did was sit down and write some letters. We call them the prison epistles, uh, letters to Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and the little letter of Philemon. And we're going to look at those, but just one sermon on each letter, pick out the high spots from each one. And today we talk about this to the Colossians. He says, Jesus is still Lord. Whatever else happens, whatever else goes on in the world, you can count on Jesus. He's going to be Lord. And so he he talks about how important he is. We need to remember that in this time. In the midst of craziness, in the midst of not liking what's going on, he is still Lord. He was Lord then. He will be Lord then. He is Lord now. In this day that I don't care for, he's still Lord. Anybody with me yet? Now, here's a good thing about You want to know one of the good things about the COVID virus? Anybody want to know a good thing? It reminds us that how weak and worthless our idols are. We, we worship things that we, they can become idols to us, and they're not worth it. Sports. Anybody like sports? Any. Anybody addicted to sports? Anybody read the Post-Dispatch every day just to make sure that maybe they'll play again? I, I, I love baseball. I like sports. And I've realized this uh, since about the middle of March. I can live without it, evidently. I have. And I got real excited because the Cardinals started playing baseball in July, and they played for five days in a row. And then, guess what? A little reminder from the COVID virus Okay, sports is a lousy God because just just not able to provide what you want it to provide. Money, a lot of people worship money. It's a great tool, lousy God. And I don't care how much money you make, you're not immune to the COVID virus. If you're, you know, the minimum salary in the Major League Baseball, and I know you're curious about these things. I'm here to help you with your education. The minimum salary in MLB is about 500,000 bucks a year. Nine of the 30 Cardinals on the roster have COVID. Nine. And you know what that tells me? You can make 500,000 bucks a year or 500 bucks a week or 50 bucks a week and you are just as susceptible as anybody else to this virus. And it, it just says that's a lousy God. For some people, our, our God is our country. You know, we love America and I think that's, we need to be patriotic. That, that's all good. We think it's the greatest place in the world. Probably is. But guess what? We're as susceptible to the virus as any third world country. But maybe the biggest idol that's been toppled is this one, the idol of control or the illusion of control, which is if if I plan hard enough, work hard enough, and I can make a certain thing happen, I can control my destiny. But the truth is Jesus is Lord and nobody else is. The book of Colossians 
is written about the supremacy and, and the sufficiency of Jesus. Here's the setting. Paul did not start this church. In Acts 19, he's in Ephesus for two years. And while he's there, the gospel goes everywhere through his disciples, people that are following Paul, learning about Jesus from Paul. They go out everywhere to preach. One of those guys' name is Epaphras. He goes to the little town of Colossae. He starts a church there. And then he writes back and said, hey, we've we got trouble down here. There are questions I can't answer. And there were two philosophies. And by the way, this little history section will only be about two minutes. Okay, so don't, don't panic. Two philosophies that really were dogging the, the Colossians. The first one was called Gnosticism. It comes from the Greek word gnosko. Thank you very much. You wanted that one, didn't you? And it just means knowledge. And they thought they had a higher knowledge. And what they really thought was, we have such a hard time with our bodies that the flesh is evil, but the spirit is good. Which meant that as long as you believe the right things, you're good, even though you behave wrong. A lot of people like that idea. Okay, you can do whatever you want to as long as you believe the right things. And to make it worse, they said, because there's, the flesh is evil and the spirit is good, Jesus was only a spirit being. He really wasn't in the body, or he couldn't have been good. So they said Jesus was not God in the flesh. That's the first problem is Gnosticism. The second one was some radical Jewish Christians trying to make everybody follow the Jewish law. And they thought, yeah, Jesus saves us, but the only way to be holy, back to that idea, is to keep the Old Testament law. We need the law to keep us holy. And what they were saying was Jesus is not his Savior, but he's not enough. And so Paul wrote about the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ in this little book of Colossians. And in chapter 1, verse 15, there's a song. Now, it, it, if you read my Bible, it may, here you go. You can see that on camera, but you can't see it. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, it's set apart a little different typeset in my Bible, maybe not in yours, but they think this was one of the early songs of the church. Now, I'm going to read this to you today. I'm going to read you the song. It's, it's got no lyric, no, uh, no uh, lilt, no lilt. There you go. No, no melody. Of course, there's no melody as I read. It doesn't have the same kind of like our poetry is, but this was New Testament poetry. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you twice. Okay, so just so you don't think I've lost my mind, I'm going to read it to you a second time. Okay, here you go. And just listen to this song. And, and it's all about Jesus. It's rich in doctrine. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth, made things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, and the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ also is head of the church, his body. He's the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. Now, your Bible may say firstborn. The idea of firstborn isn't with time. It's more of firstborn as far as importance goes. Pretty good translation. He's supreme over all who rise from the dead. He is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. Having, he made peace with everything in heaven and earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So that's a pretty good song. It's, it really gives Jesus resume, and it's a threefold resume. First of all, it says he's the maker of all things. Jesus made it all. It it's kind of echoes John chapter 1. The beginning was the word. That's Jesus. He was with God in the beginning. All things came into being through him. He is creator. And then he took on flesh and became like us. Colossians 1.15. Listen to these words again. Think about his creator. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created, supreme over all creation. Through him, God, through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth, things we see, things we don't see, thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities, the unseen world. Everything was created through him, and everything was created for him. Everything in the world was made for Jesus. He made it. Re Revelation 4, 11, he says it again. This is a song they sing in heaven. You're worthy, O God, to receive glory, honor, and power. You created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. God made everything in this world for his pleasure, including you. You were made for the pleasure of Almighty God. That, and may, that may be all you need out of a sermon today. Take that home. You were made for... Listen, you're not made to make your wife happy. Nobody's nobody smiling? It's not your job. You're not big enough to do it. You couldn't make her happy if you wanted. You're not going to make him happy either. You were created for the pleasure and the goodwill of the Father. 
pleasure, created to bring him glory and honor. One of the good things about COVID, there's about four or five good things, huh? I, I, because you slow down, sometimes I just sit around outside with a book, but I'm sitting around. And <clears throat> I've noticed the birds. Anybody notice the birds? I put a hummingbird feeder. I put more food in there today, and the hummingbird came. Sweet. I, the humming, I, you know why God made hummingbirds? Because it pleased him. He liked hummingbirds. Yeah, and, and I do too. It's, it's crazy, that little thing just... The, the hovercraft, you know, just kind of sits there. Per, pretty cool. That's a good hummingbird imitation, too. You know what else I like? Another bird that God made? Turkey buzzards. I, I think they're pretty cool. I don't like them on the road. They're not an attractive bird on the road, but in the air, I can just... <clears throat> sometimes when I'm out walk, working in the yard, they'll just circle me. You know, they, they know it's just about lunchtime. They can look down. He's not going to make it. <clears throat> But have you watched them fly? What effortless flight. And they just, they just kind of float around up there. On, and, and you know why God did that? Said, that? That makes me happy. They're made for his pleasure. And so were you. He is maker of all. When you get thinking it's not going like you want it to, remember Job, who complained to God about how things were going. And Job, God said to Job, <clears throat> who is this who questions my wisdom with such ignorance? And what he basically says, you know where I hide the hail for the hailstorms? You know where I keep the, the snow stored up? And did, how about the sea monster? You, were you there when I made that? And what he's basically saying is, until you can pull off your own creation, you don't have the right to make the rules about how creation goes. Colossians 1, 17, he adds this, to only as he maker of the world, he also is the one who holds it together. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. The book of Hebrews says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, I'm not really sure how he holds things together and what all that means. But I know it takes a load off my mind. It, it gives me some peace that he upholds, he holds it together. The world will not come to a crashing halt because somebody does something stupid. It will come to a halt when God says, I'm bringing this to a halt. That's good news. If you're like I am, in a couple of you are about my group, you grew up during the Cold War, when uh, we hated the Russians and the Russians hated us and we're just about to blow each other up all the time. I remember as a kid, I had friends who, who in the backyard, they had storm shelters. They weren't just storm shelters, they were bomb shelters. Anybody else remember these? And, and it was like a hole in the ground with a, a one-way entrance. You could pull that door shut. They had all kind of canned goods and saltine crackers down there. That's all you're gonna need. And in, in case of a nuclear th war, you just crawl in a shelter and. Take your six months in there with eating your, your canned goods. and You know what they told us in school? For nuclear war, if, if nuclear war happens, get under your desk. Huh? That was a good idea. That's going to be a lot of help. But I, I, as a child of the 60s, growing up, I, I grew up with the idea that any moment, uh, Khrushchev could launch the bomb. And we would retaliate and poof, the whole world would be gone. Except for those of us who are smart enough to have a shelter. That's, listen, it's not going to happen. You don't need to be afraid. He upholds all things by the word of his power. He's the maker of the earth. He's the sustainer of the earth. A couple <clears throat> photos out in New York City, a couple statues. And RCA, the RCA center there, out front of that center, they've got uh, Atlas with the world holding up. He's straining to hold the world up. Keep it up there. Keep, you know, uh, uh, uh. And across the street at St. Patrick's Cathedral is a statue of the boy Jesus with the world in his hand. Now, that, that, that's the way people look at it. Some people think, i got to keep this all together. And others, though, Jesus holds it all. He's got the whole world in his hands. Fascinating. He is the, the maker of all. Here's the second truth that comes out of this, uh, this song. He also is still the ruler of all. Remember what he said? He made it all, and he rules all kingdoms, even the unseen kingdoms, those they can't be seen. The angels in heaven bow before him. They, they carry out his bidding. They do whatever he tells them to do. The demons who are in rebellion against him in their minds still obey him. You notice in the Gospels, you read the Gospels, and Jesus says to a demon, leave, and the demon never says, not going to do it. The demon always obeys. I love it when I <clears throat> tell children, when, when I happen to be in charge of children, which doesn't happen very often for me anymore. 
And I, when I was raising kids, I decided to be the most stubborn person in the house. Somebody has to be. And I, not long ago, I told Violet, you need to do this. My five-year-old granddaughter, she said, no. I said, oh, pardon me. <laughs> I was losing my hearing. No, I, and, no, and you're not the boss of me, and you can't make me. Really? Are you feeling pretty tough today? At 34 pounds, you know, weighing in 34 pounds. No, I mean, yeah, I could, I, obviously I can make you, I, of course. I weigh you by everything. I, of course I can make you. You will do. You will do what I want you to do. And the, but the demons never say to Jesus, ah, we're not going to obey you today. Going to those pigs, no, we're not going in there. No, they, they always obey. He's still ruler of the church as well, Colossians 1.18. He's also head of the church, which is his body. Now, we need that reminder during a season when church doesn't feel like it always has felt. Honestly, and I'm going to confess sin to you this morning. Not your sin, not some politician's sin, but my sin. When the lockdown came and the virus hit, I worried about the church. That's my sin. I worried about the church. What's going to happen to the church? It, we can't have in-person services safely. What, what are we going to do? What will happen? Will, will people still give? We see we have several people on staff who are dependent upon those salaries for their livelihood. And more than that, we have missionaries scattered around the world who depend on the, the money that we bring, that we give. What's going to happen to those missionaries? What's going to happen to the, the church? And I was worried about those things. But Jesus is still Lord. And there's no need to worry. Now, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not about to tell you what's going to happen in the future. I don't have a clue. This may get better quickly. It may get worse quickly. I don't know. But I know Jesus is still Lord. <clears throat> and I know it's going to be okay. I know that the church is going to be fine. It may not look like it has looked before. I miss the days when we could all come together at, you know, at 8.30 and 10.45 and didn't have to have an outdoor service at night that we hope doesn't get rained out tonight again. I, you know, I, I loved it when we could all meet in here in the air conditioning and we'd jam in and you could... Remember those days? I, I used to shake hands with people. That was so, so good. And a, a few people would have hugged me on the way out. I, yeah, I kind of bristled. But still, I, I, you know, it was pretty good. I, I long for the days. When, I don't know if it's going to be like that again soon. I don't know if we're able to, able to pack people in like, like we used to. But the church is not restrained by these things that are happening. He is still Lord. It's going to be okay. And even if it gets a lot worse, he's still going to be Lord. The church is still going to be okay. Even the grave answers to Jesus, Colossians 1.18 again, he's the beginning, supreme over all the, from the, who rise from the dead. He's first in everything. So we, my, my small Zoom group, we used to meet in person, my Zoom group, uh, we're reading the book of Luke. We got to chapter 7 and 8 this week. And twice Jesus attends funerals. And neither funeral ends like they planned for it to end. Every funeral I've ever preached ended just like I thought it would end. Anybody else? With a graveside service and putting a body in the grave or putting the ashes in an urn. and that, That's how they end. But Jesus was on the way to go preach and the widow was, was coming out. She was carrying, they were carrying her only son, the widow at Nain, Luke chapter 7. And Jesus said, hey, what's going on here? Stop, stop. And they, they gave him the story. He said to the boy, he said to the, did you hear me? He said to the boy in the box, get up. <laughs> and he got up. He read the same thing in Luke chapter 8 with a, a man and his little girl. His power over the grave, which is good news for people in dying bodies. Adam Wainwright. Anybody see this video of Adam Wainwright? Anybody know who Adam Wainwright is? Okay, I, there are just a couple of us. voices. Well, culture. You need culture. Adam Wainwright pitches for the Cardinals. He's a 37-year-old pitcher. He ha doesn't have much time left pitching, but they interviewed him this week uh, with the COVID virus sweeping through the Cardinals, not able to play. And they asked him, uh, you know what he said? He said, first of all, I'm taking precautions to be as safe as I can be. But then if I get it and when I die, I'm going to go to heaven, so I'm not too worried about it. How where do you get that kind of confidence? Because Jesus is the firstborn, the supreme one over death itself. He is supreme over everything. Why is that true? Verse 19, because God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. Colossians 2, 9, Christ lives, and Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. He's ruler of all. That's really good news in troubled times. 
I don't know where you go when trouble comes. In the book of Acts, the disciples got arrested for preaching. They got hauled before the council, and the council said, not another word. You cannot preach anymore in the name of Jesus. You can't tell anybody else about it. You know what they said? Well, that, you guys decide whether we should listen to you or God. We're going to listen to God, a little civil disobedience. And they left there, and they, Acts 4.23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, now, what do you think they're going to do when they hear this report? They didn't protest. All the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. And here's how they start their prayer. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. Did you hear it? O sovereign Lord. God, you created it and you rule over everything. And so here's their prayer in verse 29. Now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through your name and through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You know what they prayed? They prayed that the thing that got them in trouble, that they could keep doing. They had preached boldly. He said, help us keep preaching boldly. Give us some miracles so, so we have an audience, and we will continue. If you really believe that Jesus is maker and ruler, it changes things. Here's the third thing. Third fact about Jesus in the resume. He's also Savior of all. Savior of all. Verse 20. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. To reconcile to, to bring parties that are at war, to bring them back at peace. When we, when we sin, we declared war on God. He declares peace. Through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Everything. Ephesians 1.10, again, this is the plan. At the right time, he'll bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven on earth. The earth is fouled because of sin. Romans 8 says that creation groans longing for the redemption that's going to come when Jesus comes. Last week we talked about the second coming. And when he comes, the earth will be destroyed with fire, but he will remake it. And he'll make a new heavens and a new earth. When that happens, he'll bring all things together, including us. Everybody, anybody, all people can be saved. Can be, can be saved. Because he... By his blood, he reconciled everyone to himself. You think, well, if you knew what I, what I did, if you know what's gone on in my past, whatever it is, anything in your life comes under the everything of Jesus and his redemption. Verse 21, this includes you, this redemption, this reconciliation, who once were far away from God. You were his enemies, separated by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. You're the holy ones, and blame, you're holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Now think, think of that last phrase. You, as you stand before him, you are holy and blameless without a single fault. That's pretty crazy. If you're in Christ, you stand before him holy, blameless, without one single fault. We do so much wrong. We have such a struggle to do right. But he says, I, I see you this way because of the blood of Christ. He's reconciled you. Do you believe that? You need to. He goes on to talk about in Colossians 2, but that when you're, Colossians 2, 12, that when you're baptized, you're buried with Christ in baptism and you rise to walk a new life. And that's possible because of reconciliation for everybody. By the way, how can you baptize people in a day of social distancing? Yeah, I mean, I guess if you both wear a mask, that's going to be unhandy for the person going under the water. Anybody see that picture? Come up with a wet mask on? That's, they call that waterboarding. And hey, you don't have to have a preacher to baptize you. Any family member, anybody can do that. And if you need help with that, then you, you, you holler and we'll help you. Jesus is the maker, ruler, and savior of all. It can be a hard thing to remember during the pandemic, but we need to. E.V. Hill is a great African-American preacher. He uh, was one of the big, big wigs in the Promise Keepers movement back in the 90s. One time he went out to Denver to Mile High Stadium. And while he was there, uh, he was being interviewed by a local journalist. 70,000 men crammed that stadium, and they sang and preached and prayed. And the local journalist said to E.V. Hill, what are you guys going to do for two days? 70,000 people in the stadium. And E.V. Hill said, well, we're going to talk about Jesus. 
And the journalist said, is that all? Evie Hill chuckled later and said, well, he just didn't know how much that was. Colossians 1, 23. How do, you, how do you remember? How do you remember the song? How do you remember the truth about Jesus in the midst of trouble? You must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Well, how do you do that? Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom. How? By teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Remember the song. We don't just sing on the good days. We sing on the bad days. The other morning I was doing dishes by hand. Huh? Everybody heard of that? Doing dishes by hand and I was humming a song. I, I, I find myself singing songs. You know why I'm singing songs? Because I'm happy. When, when you're happy, you can't help but sing. But when you're sad, it's hard to sing. But when you're sad, you need to sing. And when you're locked down, you need the song. So as I was preparing this sermon, I, I work on sermons with a friend of mine named Michael Brands who preaches over Bethel, Missouri, out west of Hannibal somewhere. A year ago, in May, his son in his 30s got the flu and, and died. I mean, that just doesn't happen, but he was a healthy kid in his 30s, got the flu and died. I walked through that process with Michael the best that I could, which I'm sure I was very little help, but we got talking about the sermon, and Mike said, you know what? There were a lot of days last year, and it was a tough year. He would honestly tell you he was just mad at God. Hmm. Hard to get up and preach when you're mad at God. <laughs> he said, I was mad at God. I prayed. I, God did not answer like I thought he should or like I thought he would. And I just had a lot to deal with. But he said, even in those days when I didn't want to sing, I'd go to church, and I would force myself to sing. And I found out that it really helped me to sing. It reminded me of the truth. And so let's stand together. We're going to sing again. And hopefully you're reminded of the truth that he is creator of all. He is ruler of this world, ruler of the other world, ruler of all worlds. And he's savior of all who will come to him.
much for joining us this morning. I hope your Sunday.